Hello, everyone. Greetings from Northern Ireland and what are strange times indeed. I hope you're all keeping well and enjoying the event. My name is Tommy Barr, and it's my pleasure to be joining you in this online version of our conference. Firstly, may I pass my thanks, please, to Dr. Kirsty Carpenter, Dr. David Smith, and to all the team for their kind invitation and for all their work and support for me personally in what has been a very new way of doing things. I should begin with a little disclaimer. I'm a practicing artist with my studio here, just 20 miles south of Belfast. And so I don't presume to approach this as an academic or as an historian. Rather, I'll speak from experience and from the perspective of someone who has grown up with and been influenced by the art of my region and of my ancestors. My mother's family name was Bent, making us direct line Huguenot descendants. This is the origin of my interest in the legacy of these French refugees and, and in the paintings I have subsequently created. It was also the catalyst for my interaction with the conference team. Our original plan was to bring the paintings to the conference and create an exhibition for you. I was then to sit on one of the panels focusing on the Huguenots to deliver this short introduction and following the subsequent discussions to adjourn with you to the exhibition for a few drinks and a short informal chat around the paintings. What might be described as a kind of fringe event and a little light distraction for you. However, I hope you will still find this arrangement interesting. It has been, as I have said, my pleasure to prepare it for you. As we know, Huguenot was the name given in the 16th century to members of the Reformed Church in France. Following Louis XIV's revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, it was estimated that more than 200,000 of this congregation escaped persecution in one of the most important movements of skilled workers and professionals in European history up to that time. Their exodus introduced the new word refugee into the English language, a word which we unfortunately still have too much cause to use in our everyday conversation. In excess of 5,000 refugees settled here in Ireland. The major settlements were in Cork, Dublin, Port Arlington, Waterford, and in Lisburn here in the north, close to where I live. In these areas, they put down roots, opening their schools and establishing their churches, which we commonly refer to as the French churches. The refugees worked their way into the guilds and professions here in Ireland, and are generally considered to have made a disproportionate contribution based on their numbers. By way of example, after David Latouche of the Latouche Bank helped the government with a loan of £20,000 in the dark days of 1778, he played a central role in the foundation of the Bank of Ireland in 1783 and was subsequently appointed its first governor. My initial intention was to create a little set of three paintings, drawing from the motifs and objects remaining in each of these five places. And from La Rochelle, the main point of exit for refugees moving west towards Ireland. 18 paintings in total. This was never an attempt to document history or to create historical paintings, but rather the motifs have been further abstracted and repositioned to create contemporary collages I'm seeking to add to the legacy. To create the paintings, I visited each of the locations, seeking out source materials and making sketches. And as I did so, I found a major focus became the places of worship, and in fact, those beautiful refuges which they had created. And so to establish a connection to that foundation, I constructed the paintings as triptychs, echoing the format of the French church windows. I also collected stone chippings from each location, which I added to the paint to build a connection to the local land. The final piece of the design was to cut a stencil from an enlarged copy of the Edict of Nantes. And this original script was then written through the paintings to create a calligraphic thread which binds them together when exhibited. It means the paintings can be placed at points along the thread of the text which creates a form of installation and allows guests to read their way along the exhibition. Having created the paintings, I plan to present them again at each of the locations, forming a series of exhibitions 
which would once again link these communities and act as a celebration of this little part of the creativity and culture of Ireland. However, as the project progressed, a second possibility emerged to also retrace the passage of those many Huguenots as they left France, following multiple routes to arrive in Ireland and subsequently moving on as Irish men and women to the New World, to New York and Boston, and I believe to Australia and New Zealand also. Taking this underlying concept of the greater journey on board has allowed the project to broaden and become more truly international. And I suppose this conference falls within that extended objective. Presenting the exhibitions has been a privilege. I've gotten to work with some brilliant individuals and have so thoroughly enjoyed hearing their insights into the history. Stories that I would have never have gotten to hear otherwise and which have fueled my energy for the project. To date, there have been seven editions, and so I suppose in a curious pandemic kind of way, this is the eighth. Only Dublin and Cork remain to be executed to complete the initial plan, though I'm hopeful it will not end there. It's my intention now to move to your little virtual tour and to tell you a little about each of the locations and present one of the paintings drawing from our Huguenot legacy at each. The first location is of course La Rochelle, the departure port. For 1,000 years, La Rochelle has considered itself the rebel city, and it's been proud of its uniqueness, democratic ahead of time, Protestant while the rest of France was Catholic and protected by the king. All through the centuries, La Rochelle has maintained this unique identity. The expression I was quoted when visiting there was La Rochelle, Belle et Rebel. The new independent town naturally adopted the Reformation's ideas. However, this also made it a threat to Richelieu's policy of unification. And as we know, on the 10th of September, 1627, cannon shots were exchanged with royal troops after 14 months of siege with an estimated more than 80% of the population dead, the town council was brought down. However, thanks in part, in large part, to maritime trade, the town has prospered over the years and intellectual and artistic influence has remained a strong factor. During the Second World War, despite being one of the last French cities to be freed, on the 8th of May, 1945, La Rochelle was hardly damaged. The central arch, and all three of the paintings, the La Rochelle paintings, is the original door frame, which is all that remains of the first Huguenot temple. It can be found today preserved in the temple garden, and you will see it on the middle canvas there with an inner edge that looks a little like the edge of a carpenter's saw. Above this frame and all three, I have drawn chandeliers. And, the, and this is the first one from the La Rochelle residence of Henry IV. I've used it to represent prosperity, peace and prosperity. This, the chandelier in this, the second one, is the one under which Louis XIV signed the revocation, which you will see, you will find in the little print in the exhibition brochure, which is being made available to delegates. In this second painting, the Huguenot cross has been broken up and the dove of peace hung as a dead game board. Peace has been lost, in the third, I've drawn the chandelier from the modern day temple, reflecting what remains after the exodus. The sketches along the bottom of all three were made on board the harbour ferry, looking back towards the city. It is a truly beautiful old harbour, which I find to be full of life and a wonderful, wonderful place to drink coffee on a summer's evening. Let's just hope we can return to that normal in the not too distant future. The second painting, is drawn from Waterford. This is Ireland's oldest city. The Vikings founded it sometime between 1853 and 19, or sorry, 853 and 914. They called it Weatherfjord. Perhaps it was a place where ships could shelter from bad weather. When King John gave Waterford a charter in 1204, it quickly grew into an important town and port. The Franciscan Foundation was established soon after in 1240. And these Franciscan friars quickly became known as the Grey Friars because of the color of their robes. The Huguenots were invited to Waterford in 1693 and 15 families initially accepted and were granted the freedom of the city. The then Bishop of Waterford, 
had the usable part of the old friary converted into a church for their use. It had previously been ruined by Cromwell and so was readily available, a reoccurring theme. Today it functions as the Greyfriars Municipal Gallery. In Waterford, the Huguenots drove the trade in linen. They acted as vintners and general merchants engaging in foreign trade. These were the first paintings painted for this series and the first contains the opening phrase from the Edict, Henry by the grace of God. The floral motifs are drawn from the stained glass of the existing church. However, the other motifs are sourced from the ruins of the earlier buildings where I was able to find some interesting remnants of stonework and a small number of original broken tiles. The use of fragments and broken objects has resulted in highly abstract images. To reflect the physicality of the found objects, I have scratched the lines into the paint, breaking the surface in order to create depth and unify the forms and patterns. The third painting depicts my home community of Lisbon. Lisbon rests on a strategic position near the River Lagan on what was the site of the Castle of the O'Neills. By the time of the restoration of Charles II, it had prospered and was a thriving community with a market. The Lagan Valley had transformed into a fertile and well-organized region with a, po a population of approximately 2,000. And it is to this town that the Huguenots and the army of the Duke of Schomburg came in 1689 in preparation for the Battle of the Boyne, a very famous event in our local history. Huguenots in the north of Ireland are most closely associated with Lisbon because of their military, economic and religious influence there. By 1711, Lisbon had an estimated 120 Huguenot families. And by 1717, the only French church in the north of Ireland had been established. However, the main reason they will be remembered concerns linen manufacturer, Louis Cremelin set up a factory here. He introduced improved techniques and brought over additional French Huguenot artisans who had taken refuge in Holland. Given these superior techniques and the superior quality of the flax in this region, it gained a reputation quickly and became central to the story of the Irish linen industry. The tree at the center of this painting is found in the Lasante Bible, which was used in the French church before its closure. The image would have been very familiar to the community as it was the only decoration in an otherwise very plain little book. The pattern around the edge of the painting is taken from embossed leather, covering a little wooden box used to keep coins in the original French church. In this collection, all three paintings contain images of trees, the other two being a tree in the Huguenot plot of the church graveyard and the tree depicted in the stained glass of the church windows. The final motif at the bottom of this image is a small circular tassel, which can be found in the stained glass of Lisbon Cathedral. This is the church to which most of the Huguenot families in my region migrated when the French church closed. In the third painting, I have depicted this tassel evolving into the Dove of Peace, which is now shown rising, reflecting this new beginning in a new land. Port Arlington, which is depicted in the fourth painting, is a town straddling counties Louth and Offaly. It was originally founded in 1666 by Lord Arlington on the land located in the bend of the River Barrow. After William of Orange defeated James at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, the lands containing Port Arlington were seized by the Crown. They were then given to Henri Massoud, Marquis de Rivigny. Later, he became the Baron of Port Arlington. Rivigny offered the, the town as a refuge to the Huguenots, and it subsequently became a very important and treasured location. At the time, the Loom House was the largest single room in the town. It was large enough to hold a congregation, and so was chosen as the site for the French church. By 1702, 500 Huguenots lived in Port Arlington. It had become referred to as the Paris of the Midlands, a place where French rather than Irish or English was spoken on the streets. The Huguenots absolutely shaped the culture and architecture of this town. Today, visitors can view houses built in the Huguenot style on French Church Street and Patrick Street. The church also continues as a place of worship, although now Anglican and English is the, the language employed. The central motif depicted in these paintings 
is the engraving found on the bronze bell presented to the French church by Princess Caroline of Brunswick, Brunswick, then Princess of Wales, in 1714. This has been blended with shapes found in a wrought iron rail, which I was able to see in the earliest known photograph of the church interior. Also visible in that same photograph is an oil lamp, the glass bowl of which has been incorporated into the design also. My overriding aim in creating the Port Arlington paintings was to achieve a balanced abstract drawing which retained the original lines and some of the beauty of the, the source objects. During the exhibition in La Rochelle, I was really interested to see that these were more, these abstract paintings appeared more in tune with the preferences of my French guests. The fifth painting represents Cork. The name Cork derives from the Irish Cork Mormoran. My apologies for the my apologies for the poor Irish pronunciation. This means uh, the Great Marsh of Munster and refers to the fact that the centre of Cork was built on an island surrounded by the River Lee. These islands were marshy and prone to flooding. The area appears to have been one of those inhabited in prehistoric times though, and a few artefacts have been discovered. The modern city was founded between 1915 and 19, or sorry, 915, it keeps slipping there, 915 and 922, when the Vikings settled and established a, a trading community. The description of Cork written in 1577, though, speaks of the city as the fourth city in Ireland that is so encumbered with evil neighbours and outlaws that they are fain to watch their gates early. However, by the mid 17th century, Cork was a flourishing town with a population of around 5,000, most of them living outside these walls. The Huguenots arrived in the late 17th century and early 18th centuries, establishing their church and a small but industrious community. The church is gone, but in the Huguenot quarter and on French Church, French church Street, the names remain. A shared outline which includes these paintings is taken from the silhouette of a headstone in the Huguenot Cemetery, as is the little motif which I have used to suggest a wave. I've applied the paint in an even more fluid manner in these, in an attempt to create a further sense of the ocean. The little bridge is taken from an old photo of Clark's Bridge, which was being constructed as the Huguenots were arriving. The flowers are drawn from the Huguenot silverware on display in the museum. Of all the investigations, Cork provided me with the most difficulty. The remnants from the Huguenots there were difficult to find, and it seems to me fewer in number. It would be an interesting study to consider how welcome and well received the Huguenots were in Cork. It was a large city and they were small, they were few in numbers. In the last of the paintings, those from Dublin, all were created using sketches prepared inside the Lady Chapel of St. Patrick's Cathedral. Dublin can trace its origins back more than a thousand years and for most of that time, it has been the cultural, educational and industrial centre of the island. St. Patrick's Church of Ireland is the national cathedral and the largest in the country. It stands on a very early Christian site where St. Patrick is said to have baptised converts in a well in AD 450. By the early 1600s, the cathedral's Lady Chapel was in ruins and there was routine flooding. During his stay in Dublin, Oliver Cromwell stabled his horses there to demonstrate disrespect. It was leased for the use of French-speaking Huguenots in 1665, and after some repairs, it became known as the French Church of St. Patrick. It remains of central importance as the Huguenots celebrate together in the Lady Chapel to this day with an annual service at evening song. For many, the Lady Chapel remains the beautiful refuge. For the Dublin paintings, all of the sketches were prepared inside the Lady Chapel. The ladies in each are drawn from the figures, though I have taken my usual artistic liberties. All of the other motifs are there to be found in the stonework and in the tiles and in the imagery. The paintings contrast darkly with the highly ornate cathedral in their simplicity. The removal of idols and ornaments from the church was important to the Huguenots. And so it's interesting that the chapel has over the years become something which they would find excessively extravagant. However, much of my work is quite minimal, so perhaps this is an aesthetic 
which I have inherited unknowingly. Perhaps less is more. This concludes our little tour and indeed my presentation. Thank you all for your interest in this project. It is one which I have enjoyed greatly and which I hope will continue to grow and evolve. I'm optimistic that my journey in the footsteps of those original Huguenots has many miles remaining and will lead to many more wonderful encounters. I do hope you have found the presentation enjoyable. Um, the brochure which I mentioned earlier, um, which I have been developing in parallel with the exhibitions, will be made available to you in a digital, digital format as a conference delegate. Thank you.